everybody for joining us. Welcome to our LA County Library virtual event, Creative Career Paths. I'm Caroline Chang, the Arts Program Manager at LA County Library, and I'll be your host today. And today's program is part of a series exploring careers in entertainment, film, TV, and uh, media, digital media industry. So in today's program, director and producer Kimberly Browning will have a conversation with costume designer Derek Cole Washington. So I'm going to start by introducing our presenters today, but while I'm doing that, we love to learn a little bit more about you. Uh, so please say hello to us in the chat. We'd love to hear from you and share with us what you're hoping to get out of the conversation today and where you are in your uh, creative career journey. So first, I would like to introduce Kimberly Browning, who will be moderating our conversation. Uh, Kimberly is a filmmaker based in LA and is the founder and festival director of Hollywood Shorts Film Festival, which launched in 1998. She is an associate short film programmer at Tribeca Fe Film Festival and a senior programmer at Catalyst Content Festival. She has been the executive producer of HBO Access since 2015 and is now part of the new Warner Media Access Programs team, developing emerging writers and directors in episodic television. And then uh, we also have our speaker today, Derek Cole Washington. Uh, from script to screen, Derek Cole Washington's work as a costume designer represents a distinct perspective and visual voice for presenting narrative and character. Her approach to design is focused on visualizing the story and composing the dress body on screen. She earned her MA in visual culture, uh, costume studies from New York University and a BA in art history and history. She is a member of Costume Designers Guild Local 892 and United Scenic Artists Local 829. And with that, I will hand it over to Kimberly to start us off. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We're having such a great time with this series. And so I'm really excited to get to talk about costumes and wardrobe today as we continue our conversation about creative careers. And to welcome one of my favorite colleagues, um, Derica, welcome. I'm so glad you could join us this morning. Yes, I'm excited. It's gonna be so much fun and I, we're just gonna jump right in. Um, I'm loving all this information that you guys are all sharing in the, um, in the chat and I'm reading them and we will touch as many things as we can, and Caroline will also be communicating with you guys um, if there's any specific things that we can answer for you later. So really excited, Derica, just to talk about where it started for you, a love of under like a love of fashion, and then really the connection where you realized that there was a career or a, some something bigger. I guess most people would think fashion design, but. How did you learn that there were these kind of careers in film and television? And what was the yes to take that leap in terms of making it your career? Well, it's interesting because I went, I'm from Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio, and I went to an art school. So when I was in high school, I did scenic design. So I got in, it's oddly enough, I got into, it's called School for Creative and Performing Arts in Cincinnati. And I got in for vocal performance. As you can hear, I have a raspy voice. But it's like, I, that was a very, my parents were like, you sing? I was like, no, I don't know. And then I was like, I'm not really into this. I was very like, you know, at stage fright. So that was like, not for me. And so I then found um, the scenic design like area. So that's technical theater. So I got in there and did costume design. But I, that was like for theater, we were like sewing like the costumes for the dance performances, things like that. But I didn't really think of it as like, you know, going in a film. I didn't think about it at all. So actually I went into the art department and kind of like was kind of there making the sets. And when I went to college, I kind of just decided to go into art history because I could at least be a teacher. That was like the profession that I least knew was, you know, something I could tangibly see doing. Um, so, so did that, you paint and draw and so, I mean, I wouldn't say I was like the best artist, but I had an, I've always loved art. That was always my thing. I wasn't the best illustrator. I wasn't the best painter, which is why I wanted to explore art history because at least my love and appreciation, I could explore it in that space. And so I wanted to go into like the museum world and exhibitions and design. So that's what like. I was really interested in. So I did my my undergrad in art history and then I decided to go get a master's in visual culture costume studies to essentially be a like 
exhibition curator, like in a right. museum field. So that's what I right. wanted to do. So tell, tell that, that I wouldn't have even known that that was a major. So, so how did you discover that that was even an option for, for advanced study? Um, because I love going to museums. I love going to museums. And, um, oddly enough, uh, my, like, like, like older cousin, like had this fellowship at the Cincinnati art museum. And so that's how I really kind of like found out about like costume studies or like the costume exhibits. I remember studying abroad in college and going to like. London and going to the VNA, the Victoria and Albert Museum, and being like, wow, I like want to be the person who puts together the exhibits because I liked that full experience that you get when you see like art, artifacts, right, materials, like all together. That's what I was interested in. And okay. but those jobs are also very niche. So sure to that was also kind of hard. Um, so I remember at my, one of my internships, um, can you say the name of what that degree was again and what school that was at? Um, so at NYU, New York university, there's a program in museum studies and you can go into different kinds of spaces. So you can go into museum studies, library science, mm -hmm. um, and you can go into costume and visual studies. So okay. that's kind of the space that you are learning about that. So that's, that became like, I guess my. More professional advanced study um, baseline of what what how I got into costume, but again, it was for costume studies and exhibitions, right? And museums, not for design, film, TV. Right. But I mean, I will never forget. I grew up in the D.C. area, so you know we were always going to all the um, the inaugural gowns, and you know, I mean, they had. The documentation, the archive of history through clothes is such a huge part. So that I, that's amazing because that I'll never forget that that had a huge impression. Yeah, on me it's such say. an experience. It's yeah. such an experience of something you tangibly get to immerse yourself in from the text on the wall at the museum to like even the wallpaper that they had, like things like that. Mm. Like it's liked that immersive experience. And so that's what I wanted to do. But the, again, that was such a niche field, but I, I have found other avenues. So just to just backtrack, it's funny. I should have a LinkedIn page so I can remember my own journey. Cause like, it's even for me, I'm like, I don't remember exactly how I got here, but I remember my first experience. Like I said, I was a fellow when I was an undergrad at the Cincinnati Art Museum and I worked at in the costume department that they have. So they do exhibitions. I remember, I think we were working on some 19th century, um, like, I don't know, dresses, wedding dresses. There was an exhibit um, that I worked on. And then when I finished school and then went to do my master's, I interned at um, Art Production Fund. And Art Production Fund is based in New York and they do works on whatever. So at the time they were doing Gossip Girl, the show, and they were doing the prop art for Gossip Girl, the TV show, not the new one that's on HBO Max. Sure, the OG. The old one. Yeah, so they were doing that. And so from there, I had met the set decorator and was like, oh my God, this is so cool. That set decorator, her name is Christina Tonkin, also did the set decoration for OG Sex in the City HBO. So wow. I was like, oh, I want to do that. I wanted to go actually into set deck because she was like well i don't really have an assistant but go check out the costume department they usually have a lot more people you almost ended up in art department i wanted to be an art department <laughs> and so then i went over interviewed met the people they didn't really have a space at the time and the show was transitioning into i think they were ending the last season so from there um i worked my first like actual job was at the studio museum in Harlem. And I was really interested again in being a curator and the person that kind of mentored me that I gravitated towards was Thelma Golden. I just love seeing this black woman who looked like me, who was running this museum, all these black artists, I loved it. And I then also was interested in development because I liked seeing how they even like acquire 
these works are, you know, not so much even being a curator. I just love just witnessing how everything worked. So that was a really great foundational experience to how I looked at art as, as the inspiration um, for me from like Romare Bearden was a big part, like collage art, like people who work with materials and, and that was just a huge part. Stanley Whitney was one of my favorite artists at the time. I mean, still is. So that was a huge part of my foundation. And then from there, um, I needed a, another job. And so I worked at an interior design firm. And um, that was your pay the rent yeah, job. Again, I was really trying to get into interior design in a way. And also at that same time was interning at an art advisory, Kim Hurston, another black woman that was like at the forefront of what I, like I, I kind of sought out people who I admired and kind of mm. worked, the people who are at the top of their game and their field, that's who I kind of sought after. And that was great that I was able to make those connections and, and not saying you have to go to the top of people in the field, but that's just, great for me living in New York that I had access to them. And I would right. say like school helped like to have that because I was able to be like, oh, you know, you know, my professors were able to advise me in that way. Nice. So that when you would reach out, would you just send an email to the yeah, office? I send an email. I send an email uh, or again, professors would advise mm -hmm. and or I sought out those people. I don't think that a lot of people knew who they were or knew how to even position themselves. And a lot of it is for Thelma, I went to art openings. They had public art mm -hmm. openings that would go and, you know, make an appeal and then follow up, ask someone, not necessarily her directly, but ask someone from the staff or team, hey, how do I get an internship? Is there a job opening? And follow up, follow up, follow up. Like you kind of have to like just be a person who's really aggressive in that way. Um, so to, to segue in, Again, I, I met Kim Hurston through um, through Thelma Golden, and then also the same thing with Art Production Fund. Like those, all all those connections became kind of like those umbrella effects of like webbing. You know, you meet one person, you yeah. start to kind of like, you know, expand your interests, expand the network, and so from there, um, I was. It's funny enough, I was dating a guy who was a writer. So this is like, I don't know, it was like 23, 24. I was dating a guy who was a writer. We were watching all these films. Like he wasn't a film and TV writer, like a novelist type of writer. Like he was okay. one of the books. So we were watching all these films. I was a little unfulfilled in the interior design space because I was just like an assistant and it wasn't interesting, it wasn't creative. I was just doing a lot of like paperwork, which I mean, that is normal, but I just didn't get to see anything specifically in that role. So we were watching all these films and I kept seeing the name Ruth Carter like in costume design. And so I then noticed that Ruth Carter was following me on Pinterest. And so I just reached out to her. Right. I, I mean, I was curious about what a, like, I, I was like, I knew what costume design was from again, being in high school and doing costume design, being in that department in theater. Um, but I really didn't know. And it, just the fact that she had designed so many of my favorite films, I was like, you know, she's following me on Pinterest, just pinning things that I'm pinning. Let me just reach out. So I reached out cold email and introduced myself and said, hi, I'm Derica. I, you know, this is my background. I'm really curious about costume, but blah, blah, blah. I live in New York. I really admire your work and sent her my resume. And she said, you know what? Your background in costume studies, art history is a really good foundation to be a costume designer. I didn't even like, okay. Like I was like really flattered. So she was like, I'm happy. She lived in LA. She was like, I'm going to be in New York. Let's meet up for coffee. And That's so we crazy. went for coffee. I mean, this is before she won the Oscar, before, every, you know, before she's on covers of magazine. So this is, I don't know what year this was. Like, uh, I can't, I can't recall exactly. It was maybe like 20, 2012, 2013. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she was just starting yeah, to be on the age. Or she was a household name. Um, even though she was already a household name to me, like I knew who she was, but yeah. I don't think the, the global national, yeah. no. That speaks um, a lot to the type of films that you were getting to know and getting familiar with and resonating yeah. with. Like those type of filmmakers she worked with in the beginning of her career speaks to a really certain type of film that's not commercial. So it speaks to you finding 
someone that was creating art that you responded to in a certain way. I've yeah. always, for me specifically, I always say the foundation of me as a black woman, I'm always looking to who is excelling, who looks like me, a black woman in their field. That's mm -hmm. where I want to reach out. That That's how I started. That's essentially what I look to. Um, so, so she was so, coming to New York. She was coming to New York. We met up. She was like, oh, I'm actually doing this commercial. It was like some Capital One commercial. And so she just hired me as her assistant. And then from there, she was like, oh, um, well, I'm doing this movie with Spike Lee. <laughs> like, and it was like a low budget little, little movie called The Sweet Blood of Jesus. And she just basically brought me on, kind of like, let me, like, she kind of like threw things at me and see how I like took them on. So she just kind of like, oh, reach out to this person. Oh, go shop this. I knew nothing about like fabric swatching, knew nothing about illustration, knew nothing about shopping for film. And like, I knew nothing about that at all, but it was, I mean, I am just like a person that I had this eagerness to learn and like figure it out. A lot of it is just a person that, um, you know, can figure it out and is, is ambitious and just focused and right. like responsible. And a lot of it is also just the questions that you ask. I'm sure yeah, that part of what she knew about you, I'm sure she noticed that you would ask the right questions. Can you talk a little bit more about when you say figure it out? To me, that's asking the right people the right questions to figure it out. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, this is kind of before, you know, Siri can give you all the answers. So, <laughs> I mean, it was going to the library and doing some research. There wasn't, I mean, yes, it was it's still like in the aughts of the, you know, 21st yeah. century. But in terms of resources, yeah, we have Pinterest. But the old school way of doing things was to go to the library or was to ask someone, was to call, um, look through a directory. I think that research mentality coming from the museum space and the museum yeah. world and understanding um, the importance of searching history. And you knew you had learned how to learn. And I think that yes. that's, that's <laughs> a component of being successful in that kind of an opportunity. Yeah, it's really about, yeah, it's, it's researching. And, and, but more than that, what I would say that I, my younger self was doing was I wasn't coming with a handout, give me a job, show me how to do this. I came having my own set of skills. Again, I came from a different background, came from art. So what I contribute, I contributed something to support mm -hmm. what she needed. Yeah. So for me, again, I'm coming from art um, and research. So I learned what I could do for her was, I'm like, again, meeting on Pinterest, I'm great at building costume boards. I'm good at putting together the mood boards, concept boards. I was good at kind of like planning the grids of like how to, to make presentations. And again, doing research, adding that element on there. So that was something that I was able to contribute. I think for me, when I look for even teams of people, what I'm like, I'm like, I don't want people who I have to tell every single step. Sure. I want you to be able to come with your outside knowledge and show me something that I don't know or, you know, help to make something more efficient. And I think that is really kind of how I kind of stayed in, in the graces of, of working with her and in her kind of like building me along and just like teaching me. It, it's teaching, but it's also kind of like this balance of like, there's this this learning and gathering and support with it, you know? And so from there, like, she kind of like brought me on and I kind of just learned about other like spaces in, in the costume department. Cause again, I was, I wasn't necessarily, I was a PA, but I was, I wasn't in the union at the time, you know? I was just like figuring out what I liked. Um, so I kind of did that and you know, it, it's interesting. I wasn't quite a shopper, but I kind of worked in the role of like an ACD. So that is an assistant costume designer. And it's weird because like, I still don't even know what that exactly means. It's just like, you're supporting the designer. So you, you're in the meetings, you're able to break down the script. You are able to kind of look at the beats, the story beats and the lines of like, okay, um, we are going to need 
you know, this look to transition, like just understanding transitional pieces, understanding caring, I like the character elements and also doing fittings, being there like to kind of support the overall vision, but also understanding the logistics. And again, it's that right and left brain thinking. You have to be creative, but you have to also, I think of doing costume is being solution oriented. You're working not with like, again, I don't have a fashion background, but I like clothing. I have taste, um, but it, it's about costume is about composition on film and TV, like understanding the framework and also understanding the body. So you're not working with, you know, fashion models. You're working with a variety of people, figures, shapes, understanding um, all of those elements and how that comes to play, composing the dress body on screen. So it's less about fashion and under, it's more about story. And for me, my background being in art, loving photography, loving painting, it, it, I love story and, and like all of that combined in costume with specifically film the film industry, because when I look at a frame or I look at a photo, it's the same thing. It's, it's like, even looking at your screen, Kimberly, like understanding, like you have on like kind of this yellow printed top, it's like goldish. And then you have this like framework of like this yellow ceiling. And then like the, like all those elements you have to understand, um, working with the DP and working with the, you know, the, the cinematographer and the production designer, the set decorator to understand how all those elements come to play. Also the talent, my biggest thing is I just, I'm on a new show now and just understanding the fitting time is understanding like how does this character play into how they're going to transition? Like, do, do they want to have a hood or pockets? Because you have to understand, it's just not static clothing from a fitting photo. They have to actually move around and perform in this. So that those were all the things that I kind of loved. And I first filmed Sweet Blood of Jesus working on that and kind of her throwing me in to like figure it out. <laughs> like, That's first a heck of a film to do as your first feature to have like, the, the it, you know to be able to observe in that very specific type of way of working um and so what were what was like the unexpected what was the way what were the light oh bulbs god <laughs> there was some okay so spike lee, spike lee the legend the veteran and working with again they've had this shorthand collaboration they've done i don't know how many films together maybe they've been, that mean, they've been working since maybe yeah, i mean his first film out of so film school <laughs> so i it's so funny because so I like literally roof threw me into everything. I was doing everything. It's just like, you're going to do set. I didn't know what doing set means. That means she, we dress the actors and just making yeah. sure that they're the continuity of what they, they have on tracks, you know? So, you know, if we have to reset, you know, lint, you know, brushing them up, rebuttoning, just restraining, making sure everything is as it was in the previous take and then makes sense for the following scene. And she, anyway, you got to do the paperwork to remember yeah. just for where does it need to go back to for that take, but also the reports and the historical archiving that has to happen if there's reshoots after the shoot. Right. Just, and you are learning that in real time from her real team. Time. <laughs> the real time. So I, I didn't realize I don't want to be a set costumer. I was like, I don't want to be a set costumer. This isn't fun. This is not fun because it's it's a certain type of brain. Like you have to be really yeah. detail oriented. And I am detail oriented, but I don't want to be like detailed in the sense of like in that way. Like that's a different type of thing. I want to like dress them, establish, and kind of walk away. <laughs> like, you know, like I want to walk away knowing that someone else is yeah. making sure and tracking that part. But yeah. that is a really great job, specifically in the costume department just not necessarily for me. There's different elements and I'll get into that later about the different departments. But I remember I was on set and one of the actors, there, there was like a fight sequence and they, I think they tumbled down to the ground and Spike goes, cut, who left the sticker on the back of the shoe? So there was literally, and he just was like so upset. He literally made me pay him $25 for making for wa <laughs> like wasting the film and i was like are you serious like 
I am, I'm a PA. You are like this film. He was like, $25. That shirt lasted for not checking all the elements. And that's again, set costumer's role, key costumer, yeah. truck costumer. But again, I'm new to this. Right? I've never done this. I don't know what I'm doing. So that I learned then that was the harsh lesson. Check every single, make sure no tags, nothing, nothing is like shown. Just because you take us again, you take a static photo of the actor, you know, front facing. You need to look what, what it looks like from the back, what it looks like, you know, then from there, I always yeah. look at the heel and the sole of the shoe. Yeah. All those elements. So yeah. I learned that lesson really hard. That was just like one of those crazy situations. But I mean, to me, it wasn't that big of a deal. But it was just, it was just funny. You from there, was a, I learned my lesson. I bet you never did it again. Never did it again. And now, <laughs> like, anytime something like that happens, I'm always saying to my set costumers, check everything before it goes to camera check every single element before it goes to camera because i don't want that to be an issue that holds up camera or now you know the actor was in the the energy and the spirit and now we have to reshoot that part because of some mistake or some yeah, some argument. minor element that now you know we have to do it again because it is it, it sometimes it is take after take and again, it's about that momentum. You don't, I know for a, a director, you don't want to lose that momentum from your talent, yeah. you know, Especially in their performance. In Ruth. Talk yeah. a little bit about as you saw the machinery, the inner workings of how teams and teams of people um, all kind of had a shorthand. Like, how did you find was the easiest way for you to learn what people were talking about? in terms of even in the costume department tv has almost a, you know a film has a really specific you know people see 47 so you know <laughs> you know i mean there's really specific um not just protocols and workflow just understanding how but in a bigger picture how did working with ruth and the way that she staffed her team help you learn what this department did so you could start to figure out what you really responded to and felt like you were really strong at? Um, I think the first experience or in terms of a film where I saw her have like a real full team was working on Selma. And I was like, oh my God, there's like all these people in the environment. Like it was literally like at least 15 to 18, maybe 20 people at one was point. It because it was a period piece and it had to be Not so perfect. A period piece, but because there were so many background, because there were so many principal lead characters. Right. Um, also, yeah, it being a period piece, but just the, the the size and scale and also the budget of the film. Right. When you're working on something with a bigger budget, you get a bigger team. And then that yeah. helps to support you. But to me, having a bigger team isn't always like the the thing that I want because that's more people to manage and check in right. with and all that. So uh, for a long time, I was very nervous about taking on anything larger than a short film or um you know something i could pretty much have all hands on because it, yeah. it was so to me overwhelming to manage and manage other people and i'm one of those people i don't want to micromanage but i can't be a micromanager where i want to be everywhere and do everything um you know like i said being on set like I, i'll go run out of a fitting to go like i need to go on set because i need to see right how this actually looks on camera i need to go look at the monitor, because even though I liked this look at the fitting, I might go and see the set is completely different than what I imagined or what we what was discussed. So, like, I'm one of those people. Like, yeah, it's a lot. So, I think seeing how she managed to have all these different people in all these different sectors. I mean, she didn't technically have an ACD, so I was like kind of like in that role where I was like in there during the fittings, but also would be there on set to help establish the look or help her like if she wanted to switch out a hat or necktie, just kind of like there um, in that way. But it, to me, like the you have key costumers who are hoping to organize after the fitting or organize things on the trailer to, to make sure that flow. So there's coordinators, they're like just fielding all the receipts and all the shopping. There's, you know, the seamstress that they're doing, you know, you have the fitting seamstress, you have the cutter that is making whatever specialty garment or, you know, anything that has to be mocked up. There's, there were just so many people and so many different positions 
within that particular project alone. Um, so that now some insight on getting to see a full beehive. But how long had you worked with Ruth before you started really feeling like this is the lane I'm going to end up in. This is where I'm headed. And this is where my strengths lend itself to, you know, was you started taking those bigger jobs on your own. Um, well, I think after that job, I went on to assist another really brilliant designer, Gersha Phillips, and she was doing miles ahead in my hometown, Cincinnati. And oddly enough, I'm working with um, uh, Emma Yahtzee Coronaldi, who is who played Nancy uh, Davis. And yeah, um, it's crazy. It's so funny because it's she would literally came into the thing. She's like, "Oh my God, you were like an assistant, and look at you, you're designing my show. Like this is." like i don't know how many years ago that was but it wasn't that long ago but it was just like the simple fact that you can move up relatively quickly depending on how you pivot and, and move honestly it's just it's about opportunity and you know for a long time i was a little like frustrated because i was like oh i'm not getting the jobs i want like it it, it is kind of like you kind of it's a juggling thing it, it really is um and it's, it's a risk sometimes because you can be on something for a long time and it could be really financially good, but you're not satisfied. Um, right, you could be working with Ruth for the rest of your career and have an yeah, amazing. Yeah, and I, I would have loved that. I would have loved that, but I think that I I saw that there, there I, I want, it, it's kind of like in all the other ways that I said, like, you know, Thelma Golden and Kim Hurston, I was like, I don't want to be an assistant. I want to be you, but like my version of you, you know, yeah. and it's like, I, I got the tools and I got the elements. And so now I can go off and, and, you know, figure out my own aesthetic and my own choices and, and, you know, my own framing. And so I think, yeah, so I did Miles Ahead and that was with Gersha Phillips, brilliant designer. And then from there, I got into the union in New York and that's the eight to nine United States artists. And my first big TV show that I was in ACG was for power season three with Frank Fleming, another brilliant designer, um, black man. He was, he was one of Ruth's assistants, ACDs back in the day during Amistad, like, like it all, like it all kind of ties in. So he, that was really the first time working actually with Frank is when I saw how in TV episodic everything works. It was third season. So they're a little bit more. It's a lot more streamlined and that show is a, a really amazing show in terms of how, um. How, how, how everything runs, because you have drama, you got guns, you got malts. Like when I say malts, that's like, you got blood, you got, you have to, there's lots of elements and moving parts, but it's a contemporary show. So it's a lot of shopping at like contemporary stores. That show had an amazing budget. It was my first time being on a show. Contemporary wear is the major budget. I didn't even know how to shop that type of budget. He was like going to Barney's, buying like $1,500 sweaters. And I was like, $1,500? I was so used to being on low budget. <laughs> I, was like, I was so used to being on low budget things where like my overall budget for a project was $1,000. So to right. work in, in an apartment where I'm doing the breakdown, I'm working with, um, you know, the, the costume supervisor and they're like, okay, this but this episode itself is gonna cost a hundred thousand dollars. And I was like, a hundred thousand dollars. Right. I, I just didn't even it's crazy because it was just like, what? That's how much we can spend? That's how much I had to play with? Crazy. Cause I remember Frank would be like, Derica, you can go to Neiman Marcus and get a suit yeah don't yeah. bring me a target suit <laughs> but I, I was again what you're talking about is really important because it's not really about the budget itself it's about the importance of the actor having the tools that they need to right, transform the into this character and also what are the characteristics of the character's life their position in the yeah, world lifestyle. that's right and so to build an authentic character you know, somebody lives in a certain type of lifestyle, the identification of how that person would make choices in their life is reflected in the clothes that they would wear. And so yes, it's not absolutely. about having red souls just to have red souls. Is this a character in her life that would have red souls? And so that budget has to reflect that. And a lot of shows, 
like you said, the opportunity because they shoot for so long that you get to invest in the type of pieces that like you're building a character for three or four years, not just the two hours that are on the screen, right? Right. So that that was a really great experience. And then also just seeing how the department was run. So yeah. on that, it was the costume designer, Frank Fleming, and then he had a costume supervisor. He had two ACDs, myself and another. Then he had a key, he had two keys. And the keys are like people who don't do the creative, but work with the logistics of like, you know, we'll fit them, they work with- They run like, production. Sure. Yeah, they make sure that, you know, everything is out of, out of uh, alterations on the trailer, pressed and steamed. You know, if there needs to be a double, they make sure to shop it. That like that's what essentially it, they can do different roles, but that's essentially what keys kind of do. Um, and they make really great money as a key because they're really kind of like key to the, the right. job. Um, and it's then the he, I remember he had another shopper, a background costumer, two set people, maybe definitely more than two, but. Two main ones, two PAs, two seamstresses. I had never worked on that full scale of a crew. Like, right. I was just like, wow. You know, and yet we still had like 15 hour days. You know what I mean? There still wasn't enough time in the day to get everything done. Um, but it, it just the efficiency of seeing how everyone had a particular role was when I was like, wow, I want to now be a costume designer that has that level of support. But I also am glad that I have worked on indie projects and know how to do all those things myself. Because I think a lot of people might come in and come in from an outside field, like either they're coming in from being a fashion stylist, they get a job and they have to kind of crew up, but they don't know actually how to do all those elements. And so for me, I think what has made me a stronger designer today is that I know how to do all those, those jobs. Productive. Yeah, I get production like, and I'm glad that I, yeah, it's like, you have to understand production and sometimes I'm overstepping my, my role at times. Cause I'm like, you know, maybe we should shoot this at that day when we have that person, because I now have been in it long enough that I, my brain can turn to right and left and think of the logistics of how something needs to work. Or if I'm like, well, if we keep this look clean, we should shoot it dirty later because then we'll have time. You know, we don't have to keep going back and forth. Right. Because it's also about the, like, when you think about an assistant director, you know, on set, they're thinking of so many things, but there are things that slip their mind. And I think making sure that you can give your perspective and also how, you know, how you do things, it's like, you know, it's usually not anyone's first time at the rodeo, but, you know, you learn different things on different sets a lot, you know, so it's, I, I absolutely love just the, the elements of like communication and camaraderie and community that you get on a film set and you learn from each department and different department mm -hmm. heads from the PAs to the department heads. It's just, you, you just really kind of are in this pool of, of really brilliant people. So yeah. I, I love it. So I want to talk a little bit about um, as you move into a production designer space and learned what were the skill sets that you felt like you had that gave you the strength and the ability to, to fulfill what that means. I think there's a specific, every great production designer I have worked with really inherently had a human communication ability. They were fantastic communicators because they, the, those of you who do it really well are able to team up and partner um, with the director and helping understand and helping almost every director comes from a really different framework. They talk differently, they think differently. And being able to understand what the director means when he's what's on the page versus what's in that person's head. And so how to, how to translate 
what he or she is thinking and navigating, okay, how do we do this affordably? And and that right. other part of it is how can I be a yes person, understanding how to extract this version and give them options that work within their resources. But most importantly, you're creating a being. You're creating a person who is feeling thoughts, dreams, and goals. And you're responsible for crafting what the options are. So that communication is so critical when they can be really eccentric. They can be from different parts of the country, come from a POV or point of view in the world that you've never been to or experienced. So talk a little bit about what what was in your personality and what you did well that helped you do that, you know? Sure. So, I mean, it really is, it is a relationship. Um, I, I feel like it's, it, it also matters the difference of when a writer is also the director, you know, writer and director versus a director and a separate writer. And now, you know, a lot of times the writer isn't there or the writer isn't a producer. So there's this element of like interpretation. So for me, I look at it like I, I read something, I'm automatically, when I'm reading, I'm visualizing. This is not a novel, but even, you know, when I read a novel, I visualize. That's again why I loved film because I am a visual person. So I'll like read it and I'll have things in my mind. I have things in mind what this character looks like, whether they describe them or not. I, I can just kind of make my own interpretation. Um, and sometimes there's descriptions in the text, you know, um, in, in this, like in the script. And other times I'm like, okay, like, like, for example, I'll, I'll use one. There was something I was reading uh, a serpent. I was like, oh, and she had a Gucci belt and this and blah, 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 and, you know, the shoes and the dress. And I said, you know what, does it have to be that? Are we married to that idea or is this just, you know, I'm, it's always about, I feel like even when I talk to my shoppers, present what you think and how you interpret it because that's why they're hiring you because you don't want to be just a yes man. Present alternatives and then give them one element of what they actually asked for. So, and then see how they respond and that will really tell you a lot about how your working relationship is going to be. Yeah. Because I always feel like there has to be a guide point. Sometimes directors don't always make the most thorough lookbooks. They might be doing it for cinematography and not necessarily for costume. So you gotta like gauge like, okay, if this is the lighting you're using, maybe that color might not work well. Let me show you what's gonna work well with what you are envisioning. It's about really kind of presenting and figuring out how we all make this come to life in a way that's harmonious and and like compositionally makes sense and, and yeah. characterized for me and story wise makes sense because a lot of times you might I might read a script and it it might be like oh they wrote it six years ago so now that might not be relevant now mm -hmm. so it's just like you know just making sure you have that kind of thought to kind of interpret you know where they're at because yeah. I've just but like there's that element. I mean, my first working relationship with, um, I'm trying to think, I've had really great collaborations. So one of them is with um, a director I work with. I, I love her, Tiffany Johnson. Her and I did a, a short together through um, the, what is it? Um, AFI DWW program. The Directing for Women program. Mm -hmm. Um, AFI American Film Institute, great program, women, uh, and it was a short film. And we, her and I, just clicked. She had like a brief, like little lookbook, and then I, I, I love when someone presents me with something because I like to have boundaries or I like to have some level of of idea to to blow it up. Like you give me an inch, I'm gonna take a mile on how to interpret that. Just giving me one element will help my gears turn. So yeah. she gave me like a one page and I created a lookbook and she was like, oh my God, I love this. Uh, but again, I have a good sense of making a lookbook. Same thing with working with you, 
when mm -hmm. we worked with John Ridley. That was, I mean, one of, I, I literally, we spoke last week or whenever it was, and I said, that was the best experience I've had, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, with somebody who I didn't prior, you know, previously work with and someone who's such a veteran in the field. But also, he's just a person who's just a veteran in the field and knows what he wants. And but it was specific. Very you know, specific. Exactly what he wants, as opposed to when you and I did that HBO show together, there was a lot of latitude for you to come in and show us what great options were and have that director get to make choices. So in both of those spectrums, you are yes. again, you asked great questions. And you know I mean? I, yeah, so I'll talk about HBO Access too, which is how we initially met. But with, with John, with that project, he had like some, I think he just shared, like, I don't think it was like a deck or anything, but he just had like character. He had, reference. he had a reference. He had some references. And so then from there, he had some references. And then I interpreted those references. Yeah. And he was like, oh, yeah, well, this is great. So I gave him alternatives and, and was able to kind of dive into the world that, that he wanted and, and kind of go from there. And that's what I loved. And I like, again, the specificity. Yeah. And it's great to work with someone who can be specific, like that specific instead of, oh, I don't know, let's see it on the day, let's audition on the day. Because to be frank, as a costume designer running a department that that slows down everything. It slows that's down that's every that's um, And it, it can that's waste that's money that's and time. That's <laughs> that's so exactly. just not but knowing you what you directors who will not make a decision until they get yeah, on the set. The is, you have to work with him. Yeah. It's so wow. stressful. That's what makes the job stressful, I think. Right. I think love my job except for when someone could be indecisive or they don't trust my judgment of something where they're questioning, I don't know. I wasn't well, seeing it that that's way. I think, you know, talking about what kind of personality traits I think really work well in this space, um, being able to have great knowledge base and great historical knowledge base and knowing how to find out, do research, but I also think it's really important that the people understand how to. People who are really great costume designers and people who are really great and succeed in the costume department understand that things are going to change and it's not about you, right? At the end of the day, there's going to be things that were intended that you spent a month working on and you get on set, it doesn't work and you have to move on and be able to adjust and adapt pretty quickly, I think is a really critical personality trait for this particular department because it's so critical to the relationship with the director and the costumes relationship with the actor are the two critical points that are that will make or break anything that's put on screen. And I Absolutely. think those kind of personalities that you you and your team always have um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that actor relationship because for most departments don't have a lot of direct collaboration with the actor, but costume has the most important and hair and makeup works under that vision. But not only you as the designer, but you hiring a team that's going to be able to take really good care of an actor, understand actors have a couple of different significant ways that they work and you have to kind of know a little bit about acting process and navigating also a huge baby is feeling bloated that day or has cramps or yes. is overweight or is underweight and navigating their own personal needs and keeping them in a headspace that they can be the best that they can be that when they hit on set they are nothing but that character and and taking care of them along the way. So what are the personality traits that you like to look for that attract you when you're crewing up um, that can accomplish those things that are essential to be successful on set? Leadership and solution oriented mentality. I always, anytime I have people, I'm like, don't come to me with a problem. Don't, don't say we lost blah, blah, blah. Tell me what the solution is. It doesn't make sense to to dwell on problems when we don't have the time. Like, come to me with an alternative. Like, I've had a situation. So, uh, a film I did that got released this year was Zola, and there my ACD was like, "Oh my god, I can't find the shoes." And I was like, "What do you mean? Why wasn't the shoe with the costume?" What do you like? I just didn't understand. And I was like, "I don't even want to be thinking about that. What is your solution?" 
it was like a, a mule like with a like feather like a not a feather but like a it was like a slipper with a mule um and so she went and found another like just plain mule she went to michael's and got a boa and made like you know recreated but yeah that that's like what i needed her to do i like she did do that she just was like letting making me aware that you know that wasn't the same shoe but hey i i came up with something it's about that like there's plenty of times where I might have presented something in the costume meeting, but we ended up returning it. And it's like, hey, I know you liked this sweater or this jacket. I found these other alternatives based off of, you know, your preference of liking that. It's about not saying, it's yeah, you can admit, you know, your mistake or whatever the case, but have a backup, have a have yeah. a solution. Don't just be like, oh yeah, I'm really sorry. Like, right. I don't want to be, I don't want any sorries. I want someone who's going to be like, okay, this is what I have. Um, and, and leadership is people taking the initiative to, to do things. Like, I, I don't want to always have to tell and like, I can delegate, but I want to see that you see what I'm expecting and you're just on it. You know, mm -hmm. and that's again, a personality thing. Self-starter. Like, Self-starter. Yeah. It's like, independently well people who work in a team well, right? I also think communication is really important. Like people who know when to communicate and what needs to be said in that time because there's already enough on any given basis, there's 17 things that need to be solved. And right. so a, a calm spirit, someone who can go into a storm, people losing their minds and being a calming force is really important in this department, particularly because you are near the actors and you're at that energy. You can't flip out. You can't yell and scream. You can't be that person navigating. You got to identify issues and solve them quietly and calmly because you are right next to the two most important energy fields for the show. So you, you can't flip out on the director. You can't flip out on an actor. You got to keep their feet on the ground. And so um, I've also found that people who do really well in the shows that that I run and I really love working with are just, they're great pilots. So if there's turbulence, if there's lightning, if there's rain, if there's a storm, okay, it could be bumpy, but we're going to get through it. There's always this demeanor of um, we're going to get through it one way or the other that I have found um is a really strong characteristic of everybody I've loved working with, including you. Um, yeah, I mean, so that our first experience working on HBO Access, I had three different directors and three different writers, uh, you know, huge cast of different people. Um, so that was a great experience to kind of twenty dollars. Was it thirty dollars uh, or was it twenty dollars? I think it twenty dollars. Twenty dollars. No kidding. Um, but yeah, it's like what I had to do with that was three, like again, three completely different projects, three personalities, um, and it was interesting to see just like how how each of them worked and how I had to approach them differently. How I created three different lookbooks. I'm that person where I approach making a lookbook completely different for each project I work on uh, or mood board. So it's, it's interesting when you get to do that. And I always think about the tone of each, each project had a different tone. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's, it was great to do that because I got to have these, these different, a completely different kind of vibe for each thing. Yeah. And I think that again shows that was such a, a challenge for me in the sense that like I got to do three different vibes, three different stories, three different kind of costume worlds. And that that was like kind of like this this moment for me. It was like a trial of of um do you really like this field? Can you really do different you know, you have to be flexible. Like you could be a costume designer who only does horror films. That could be your genre, that could be what you do. I, I like to think of myself as being, you know, I, I'm always driven by the story. That's how I select. It's not about what it is, who it is. It's about the story. So it could be a horror film, but if I like it and I, it resonates with me, 
been great. But yeah, it, it's like I, all of it, it kind of can be a little different. Um, yeah. So it, it's really, it's, it's interesting too, because, uh, you know, costume design, there's so many different elements. Like, again, I, I flip between doing costumes for TV, for episodic, and I do film. And even with episodic, it's different. Episodic, you could be doing a comedy, which is usually half hour. You could be doing a drama, which is usually, you know, an hour. Um, so just even the approach with doing those two are, are different. Sure, um, sure. Film, you know, you could be doing a short film, you could be doing a feature length. Uh, it, it just is, it has its own things and being able to kind of work in all those different worlds. And I also do commercials. And commercials are its own other thing because it's like you have to advertise what you mean by that when you say it's its own thing. What's a um, little bit different about how commercials work and how costumes work in that? That's I'm, different. Yeah, so, oh, I'll also go back into like features and, and TV um, features. It could be an indie feature. So uh, doing Zola, it was an indie film with A24, which had that was the financer, but. Um, well, it's a smaller scale, budget, small themes, smaller cast, maybe. Um, cast. So indie film also, yeah, it tends to work a lot faster with a lot less resources as opposed to say, um, and they tend to also um, not have a lot of fabrication. So as opposed to big stunt shows that are going to have aliens, animals, um, armor period yeah i mean but for me even working with indie it's what i what i like about indie filmmaking is usually it's just the financier is usually giving the director the the full range of whatever they want to do and there's usually one producer that's kind of like you know helping to support that i mean there's multiple producers but there's usually one that's really on the ground kind of like helping to support you know whether it's helping to get a bigger actor are you saying more that indie film tends to be more about that director's vision? They have a little, yeah, it's more creative control coming. It's more from creative. It's it's as opposed it's, to it's, bigger films that can have a lot of moving parts in terms of the creative. Parts. Parts. There's a lot more investment of in it. holders in who gets to make creative decisions is the difference between indie. There's a big chain of command. There's yeah. a bigger chain of command with bigger projects. And that's what I learn all the time. So coming from working on indie, where again, my first project being with Spike, he financed that, I think, I think he financed that film. Like he got to do whatever he wanted completely. And it was interesting to see somebody, we've been working with John Ridley, got to do whatever he wanted. And so when you then work and you see, you know, frustrations with your director, they're usually not because they're usually because of whatever kind of element creatively they're not able to do just because someone's not okaying it or yeah. there, there's approvals that has to be made. So for me, that I also comes that down to me. For people who are who are listening, they're really looking at identifying these different pathways because is this the kind of place I want to start trying to work? I feel like some of the bigger shows have a lot more PAs and apprentices. Yeah. And so there is some opportunity there that one should keep their eye on because they just can hire more people in a costume department. But I also feel like for those that can get PA opportunities on smaller shows, you get to learn more faster because you get to have your hands on more stuff. Can you, was that your experience? And yes. In, so I, again, not knowing I was going to go on this path, it wasn't something I was pursuing you know, full heartedly in a sense. Yeah. I'm glad I had my first experience on an indie set and working in indie because I got to, again, see everything, do almost everything. Right. If you're working on, let's say, like, again, if you're doing, and I'm gonna break it down, network TV, which isn't quote network, it's more like you have streaming, you have network, We'll call it net, for now, call it network okay. for the parameters of this conversation. Yeah. We're going to say network cable, premium cable. Yeah. If you're working on that, yeah. there's, yeah. there's a lot more, you, you pretty much do your job. That's what you do. And it's a very it's a union job. Yeah. Well, not, it's a union, not, if it's a union show, a PA can only do 
PA work. If it's a non-union, you they have you have free reign to kind of do whatever someone allows you to do. Um, so with that, you know you you are restricted in, if you're on a network because you get this you get to see the action, but you can't really. It takes longer for you to be able to get the experience to be able to move up into other departments. And but I do feel like for the people who can get in on big network shows, they have more opportunity down the road. I think down those the road. to last longer. I think those um, hiring people tend to keep their teams together a little bit more. You can get a season or two of television. Once you're kind of in, it's a bit easier to bounce around from show to show. So I think yeah. there's some benefits for those people who you might you might. Um, it might take longer to rise up through the scale of ascendancy in the department, but you're, you have more job security down the road. Yeah, 100%. You have more security yeah. and your pay is more regulated. For a certain you get paid every Friday. And yeah, I also it's feel much like more regulated. people who run TV um, departments have tend to keep their teams together a bit. Yeah, you you have more job security. You have just, more, job just security. more job security versus like indie. You know, the, it may take a while with payroll. I don't know. Like it, it's a it's a different kind of thing. So, but me starting again, that was the risk I took when I kind of branched out to design my own. My first film that I did was called um, How to Tell You're a Douchebag. We shot that in New York. I forgot what year it was. Uh, but it's so amazing because everyone's there. The cast, um, Dewanda Wise, she she's doing amazing. Um, very cute. Yeah, and uh, um, William Jackson Harper is on the new season of Love Life and and The Good Place. Amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. but that project, I mean, I think I made only five hundred dollars. Only had a five hundred dollar budget, and it was a thirty day shoot, ten day prep. At, you know what I mean? Like I didn't make any money, but I got to have this odd experience. And, yeah, exactly. So, so it's, it's, Gwendolyn, it's a big risk. Yeah, Gwendolyn, I see your question about live theater. It's its own um full oh, yeah. thing. We're not gonna be able to get into how it's different from live theater because that in of itself is a uh a day to talk about. But um, Gwendolyn, please feel free. There'll be ways you can connect with us. And if you are interested in live theater, we can send you some resources to get into that lane. Um, so, so Derica, talk a little bit. Um, we also want to touch on the word apprentice, the word internship. What does that mean? If I'm looking for those kind of opportunities, what does that mean? What what is it I should, what kind of costume designer? Because as many people as I love working with, and I'm really blessed to be able to, to have worked in this business a long time and get to choose who I want to work with. There are people out there whose, whose work process and, and working style and personality, I find harder to, to deal with. It doesn't work well in my style. I think there are, how can you tell you're working with somebody good? How do I find a good mentor? What, are, what are some things that people are looking for apprenticeships or they see an intern listed? What should I look for if that's a good opportunity or not for me to pursue? As a, from the perspective of the intern or the perspective of someone? I'm someone who's interested in, in costume design and I want to get on the ground floor and I'm looking for a situation that's going to be good. What does it mean to be an intern? What does it mean to be an apprentice? Are those two things the same? Are they different? How do I know that this is going to be, um, you know, for me, I, I love when it, if it, if it's a big department, it's a, I know it's a, anybody who's, I love looking at the director's name and looking to see what they've made and if it's stuff I like. Mm -hmm. For me, I think you expressed really beautifully how you discovered Ruth because she was making films that you resonated with that meant um, that had impact on you creatively. So you knew things about Ruth's style and vision that you knew she was going to be a mentor for you. Is there any other advice that you have for people that are looking for internships and interns or apprenticeships, how to find things that they're going to 
grow and learn in a, a new great way. Yeah, I mean, it, like it's, like you said, it, it is about kind of looking at, you can look at someone else's resume and be like, oh, okay. I mean, you can look at where they started, but, but look closer to their latest work, because that might be more of an indicator of where they actually want to go. Because even for me, I, again, I've made lots of choices, and I even look at my own like resume, and I'm like, you know, I I want to have a career that actually reflects the projects I'm interested in. There are things that I might have taken or things that I might have done, and I want to make sure that they all kind of reflect, you know, who I am and what I what I want to represent. And I, I haven't quite reached that point where I am getting those yet. You know, it's kind of like some of them like, oh, okay, you know, I maybe didn't need to do that one, maybe this one. So it's kind of like, again, looking at maybe the latest as kind of like an interpretation of where that person is, but also seeing where they were going. Again, I was willing to take risks early on so I could get my foot in the door so I can get the title of costume designer. So right. I took those risks. I took, you know, budget, you know, cuts. I took, you know, pay cuts because I, I wanted you know, um, I wanted to design. So, but I, I would say for that, like, yeah, look at, you know, look at kind of people's journeys and also ask like, where, where do they see themselves? I mean, I, I always ask my PAs anytime I have like PAs, um, because I don't think a lot of people just want to stay PAs. I mean, when they know that you, they can make more money, but if again, you get more responsibility with more money. Um, but it's like, I'm like, well, where do you, what, what if you want to stay in this department, what area do you want to be on set? Do you want to shop? Do you want to design? And then I start giving them little tasks that are more geared towards whatever they want to pursue. Yeah. Yeah. Because I am always a big fan of helping someone, especially, and I'll, I'll talk about, I mean, I can talk about this briefly, or if you don't want to go into this about unions, I think when you recognize, oh, I didn't really understand what the union was until like other people I saw were like in the union and understanding you get health, really great health care, and just, you know, you have a, a rate that is more solidified, um, benefits, things like that. Um, that I always am a big proponent of trying to help people into the union to, to have those that security. Um, so I always ask like, okay, so you know, what do you want to do? What do you want to pursue? I want to know what your goals are. You know, a lot of some people are like, oh, I just, I, I'm, I'm curious and I, I just want to kind of float around and see, um, you know, what, what I'm, you know, interested in. And it also just depends on you're where strong you're what your skills yeah. really testing. I think um, also another avenues in terms of there's film, network film, there's indie film, studio film. There's the different types of television production. And I think wardrobe departments are so critical for music videos and commercials. People that work in those costume departments because um, it's all visual, very little dialogue a lot of times. And so the costume design sometimes is telling so much of the story. Um, so I find that those are arenas as well that are great for young up and comers to get into that, but it's a different way of working. It's fast. It's furious. It's way it's more fast. Fresh. It's fast. Or some fresh. people, people like to are be not as nice. People are not there to be friends. People aren't there to come. Yeah, it's friends. different, it's really different energy. And I also find that, um, I don't know if you've done a lot of live television, but no, costumes, yeah, costumes. Um, there's so many great costume designer and costume professional careers that took off with the advent of um, performance television from American Idol to mm -hmm. You Think You Can Dance. And now these amazing shows like Mask Singer and the, you know, these shows, costume design has become such a huge part of the creative impact. Um, and, and people are, are uh, their careers are expanding and working in those frames and then all, you know, Grammys, Emmys, they all have um, um, big costume departments, everything from the dance sequences to any of the gags. Late night TV also has wardrobes. So I think these are areas in our yeah, business yeah, that people don't think about that um, are, are huge areas that not as many people think to try to start. 
there might be more opportunity because everybody's trying to get onto a Marvel movie, right? Yeah, I think, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, a friend of mine who you sh I'll connect you, um, Jolene, she, um, another black woman, she is a costume designer. She does Master Chef. She does AGT Live. Yeah. Um, again, you don't think that some, you just don't think about that. I, I have one of my assistants who's like my key assistant. She does like AGT, those types of shows and does what I do, which is film and TV. And she says all the time, we have so many more assistants on that show. But I was like, it's a different, I don't know what that, I've never worked in that. So I have no idea how that world was set up. But Jolene, that's like what she does. Um, her and I have never really sat down and talked about the difference. But, um, but I think it, it's interesting because she's kind of more hidden. She's a lot more hidden of a talent, like in terms of like her as a costume designer. Just, they are not really acknowledged in live TV. Right. Um, and not to say that that means anything, it's, it's her job, it's her profession, it's her career. And, and in, a, in a similar yeah. way, like how I, like how I was just saying, like, you know, you can look at someone's resume and be like, oh, you know, do, what is their trajectory? What's their career path? I would never have thought to look at, like, I don't even think they really register them under IMDB like that either. Um, but it's a great, I mean, she does really they amazing work on those shows. They work, they work all the time. They're doing amazing they do, they creative work stuff. All the, she works constantly. The and the Emmys have really expanded yeah, the awards amazing. and the acknowledgement that's happening in that side of the business. RuPaul's Drag Race. Like, they're um, killing it. Zombie, that, that's the amazing. Part. He's won so many Emmys as a costume designer. Right. Um, he, But again, that is interesting because I have, that's a completely different beast. And again, you, you could have a, talk with her, that would be great because I feel like I would love to sit in on that because I, I know nothing about that as an arena. The most I know about that is a little bit of my work in commercials because commercials, like we were saying, commercials and music videos, those are so fast paced. It's usually like three to five days of shooting and you're done, you know, and they, the quick turnaround. People you can who maybe really keep your well team. People who do well in that space really have to have thick skin yeah, it's a different personality and I really be able to um, have a lot of things are going to change all the time, even while you're filming and you have to roll with it. It's a much more intense personalities and intense, but there's some people who are great at that and, tell it. and they make more money than anybody. They Come do. On. There, so during the pandemic, the like, or like last year, last fall, I want to say when things kind of like when the industry kind of picked back up, September through December, I did about five commercials. It was yeah. crazy, it was COVID. Um, and at that point, you know, I had been working, I didn't want to do anything long-term because of COVID. I didn't want to do a long-term project. And a lot yeah. of people don't like doing long-term projects. So I'm currently on a new Hulu show and we are uh, about to start shooting next week or after, sorry, after Thanksgiving, when we go into the end of May. A lot of people don't like long-term jobs like that. Right. I do. I personally do because I just like the security of it. Your lifestyle. Like investing into the characters. I like building the closets. I like that. But I have worked with some people that are commercial. I try to bring that I love, like personality-wise, and they do a good job. Like one of the girls, she um, did a commercial with me um, for the Super Bowl, and I tried to bring her on to this. She was like, I don't like long-term jobs. She like, I like to get in. I like to get out. Like, yeah. I like that's the lifestyle. It's a lifestyle choice. It's a lifestyle choice. Friends of mine who are raising kids also love working on like um stage tell shows that are shot on stage, right? Yeah. Because it's way more um you kind of have the same start time. You're the same yeah, you, do on dinner, you don't work on weekends. And those kind of shows that are stage shows, single camera comedies, half hour comedies they tend to have much more regulated time and you can have a family and take care of your parents and raise your kids. And um, yeah, and commercials are really great for that as well. If you are uh, a seamstress for a shop, for coffee designer that does a lot of commercials, you can work all the time, but you're not gonna be, um, it's way more 90 to 5 -y. Well, Right, yeah, they're not, they're not having you there at 3 a.m. <laughs> so but yeah. 
Yeah, I wanted just to pivot. One, one thing I did want to say though was with with like even for me, and that's why I'm saying I I wanted to do the current project I'm on because I you know just for context I'm 33 and yeah. now I want to move into you know I I I there's there's people I admire career wise, but I'm also like they their life is their career. And I want to have a work life balance. I, I want to go vacations. I want to spend time with my family. Um, and again, thinking about the kind of career and the kind of life I want to have, I want to have that balance. So as I decided to take on this longer show, it was because I want to be able to transition into something that is on stage or something that I could have, you know, a long term thing and it's more regulated, like in terms of. My commitment, I know I'm going to be on this. I know our hours are going to be more set. So I could have more time to kind of dedicate to, to not only myself, my self care, but potentially starting a family and, and having that type of life. It is, you know, working in this field, it is, it can be so consuming if you let it, but you can make wise choices yeah. for that not to be the case for you. And I feel like, you know, I, Got like in my 20s, I was in a hustling mode. I wanted to get in there. I wanted to do that. Now I'm like, okay, I don't want to be working that hard. I don't want to be that stressed out. I don't, you could be traveling, doing jobs on site. I don't know if I want to be trying. I haven't taken a job outside of LA since 2020 or no, 2019 because now I'm like, I feel settled here. I kind of want to be here. It has to be something really special for me to want to to do it because it is a, it, it is an uproot. And, um, I think that's just really important to kind of note because like you like you're saying all these different kind of um ranges of things do mm -hmm. make a difference in what paths you do take and you can still do that type of work you can still be a costume designer you just do fulfilling work yeah. and you can have a better kind of lifestyle so in the costume department and and we want to get this in before we wrap up there's so many jobs in the scale of what the costume department is that I think really lends itself where well to people who work trade jobs. There's so many trades that work steadily within a costume department um, from tailors to sewers. And we've listed in the chat the, the union website that um, lists a lot of the different departments and a lot of the different specific jobs at both um, costume houses and production. And um, for those that are considering moving in, if you're not a designer, if you are not particularly an artist, if you don't know what a color wheel is, there's still work for you in this part of the section of our business. But particularly those that are um, good at, um, remember there's whole departments that fabricate costume costumes so when you're dealing with um a film or a television show that has soldiers and uniforms and there's so many different trade skills that are covered by the union so um uh finished costumes custom made costumes uh so please go to those websites but can you talk a little bit about those trades that you use all the time that yeah. people don't um, use? Yeah, so for example, there's the costume houses. So Warner Brothers, um, what is the other one? Warner Brothers, Western, Apple. Apple. They all, everybody's got a costume house. Yeah, everyone has a costume, costume house. You can work in the costume house. I personally, just, <laughs> I'm saying, just to be honest, I, the costume houses are great resources to work in. I personally don't love them. I wouldn't, I, in my personality, I couldn't work there because you're literally surrounded by yeah. clothes. In a big and old warehouse. I'm not coming from fashion, let alone coming from the retail experience. So even for me, I'm like, I get overwhelmed seeing right. all of that. Sure, but let's um, talk about the kind of opportunity. Like, if you there. love clothes. If you yeah. love clothes, you like seeing, and you like seeing a range of things. This costume house, you see the sci-fi costumes, you see period pieces, you see all, you see everything, and it's kind of like a, an organization. Yeah, but I think also um, what's really important, particularly Universal Western people who have great knowledge of historical of history, who really understand research, 
who were specialists in the Civil War. Yeah, specialists. People, because when I go into those places, their knowledge base helps me do my job as a filmmaker. Because yeah. they know when they read our script or if I give a description of this character, the knowledge base of the people that work at the shops, but there are also full seamstress, the full catering, yeah. they, they really also have dry cleaning, you know, I mean, there's a full range in the um, ecosystems of the costume houses and some costume houses specialize in niche period. And so yeah. I think it's important Palace that- Palace is one. Yeah. Palace. And then there's also other places. Um, there's the Ruby, which is more contemporary high-end fashion. Really yeah. amazing yeah. place. I love that place because, I mean, I am more of a contemporary designer. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, I like period, but I, what I'm interested in right now is more contemporary or sure. even future-based. And so when we're talking about those kind of job opportunities that somebody can aspire to begin to get on the track, um, I think talking about contemporary has its own really specialty um, positions. Uh, I think people underestimate shoppers, especially in contemporary yeah, and understanding, you know, you don't have to come from fashion, you don't know how to, so there's specific things of if you uh, have a certain expertise or passion, you can create a job for yourself in the costume business because that's essential knowledge that's really valuable for us. A shopper is essential for me right now. And that's what I look that I'm always looking for shoppers because it's hard to find good shoppers because it's not about like people get confused with a shopper is it's not about uh, you having it's about having a good eye, but also under, un, being able to understand what I'm asking for. Like sometimes I don't give enough info for them to go out and shop, but also if you're reading the script and you're getting it. Like, you should be able to kind of like pull those things together. I'll give a, a shopper a mood board. You figure out how to interpret and find those things. But you're not just shopping one item. You're shopping a full look. So don't just bring me a top. Bring me multiples of that top because that person's sizes could be wrong. So that's what, that's what makes a good shopper. Getting that same top, getting small, medium, and large, getting the belt, getting the necklace, getting the pant, getting multiples of the shoe, multiple shoe sizes, and, and getting that. One of the elements that helps to, um, that we have in our industry to um, help support shoppers is studio services. So if you are a person who's interested in costume or becoming, actually being in the world of costume and being in like the film TV sector, you can start off being in retail, like at a Nordstrom in Bloomingdale's, and, and like Macy's and go and ask, Hey, is there a position in studio services? You're working directly with the costume designers, the shoppers, the ACDs, because they're the ones going in there to shop and pull. And so You're what that to create that resources audience. for them. Yeah, so for the audience, studio services is in any, pretty much anywhere we go. We are not necessarily always having to buy and return everything. Most re big retail have a department that works with film and television where we rent those skills that, that we can rent a lot of the elements that are in that store and then things are restocked and the production would pay a rental fee and a restock fee. So it's we're like not- really, Yeah, exactly. But it's like a rental house within the big, so instead of having to go to Michael Kors or go to um, the house of Gucci, uh, you could go to say a Neiman's, be able to access all of those different retail brands but work with their studio services in being able to shop and being able to maybe rent some of that stuff and not have to purchase it all. So that's a great opportunity and a great job that people wouldn't think about would get them into. Think about, and you have regulated hours if you work in the studio. Yeah. And that's then really you, get to, you get to meet the costume designers and shoppers and all that. And if you wanted to transition to be on that side, because I've met people in studio service that are like, you know, I would like to shop. Because I'm seeing what you guys are doing. I'm seeing what you guys are buying. And I could I could do that. And I could do that and be able to do it at multiple stores. Because if you're just seeing what I'm buying at your store, imagine what I'm buying at all these other stores. Yeah. So it's like I've met people who are like, yeah, I would I would be interested in, in doing that. So it there's so many avenues to get in. That's probably an avenue I would have, if I would have known about studio services before, I would have gone into studio services and then transitioned. I'm because also 
excited about um, there's more opportunities. You don't have to be in LA and New York to start your career in this business. And I know this is LA County Library and a huge part of our audience is here in LA, but we are having people that are listening from across the country and are watching us. And so um, that's where if you look at where production's happening, you can Google where there's a film commissioner. If that state has a film commission, that means there's production going on in that town. And we all know New Orleans, Atlanta, um, Kentucky, Minnesota is going to be the next great thing. Minnesota just passed a huge amount of tax incentives, as did um, Oklahoma. And oh. so the states now are going to have a lot more film and television coming into their state. And a lot of times people will transition and start working there. If you've got a cousin or a grandparent that lives in those states, you can become a local hire using their address, mm -hmm. having a place to stay where you went to college. So there's a lot more opportunity to get entry level and, and second level um, opportunities in costume because there aren't a lot of skilled people in these regional areas. And most of those places would be right to work states. So you, you could have to be, be in a higher position you could be in a higher position and not necessarily be a PA. That's right. And being able to get onto those independent shows um, that you can rise up and build your list of credits and get your experience. Then as you figure out if you want to go on the union um, and if you, then you know which jobs to take because you've done your research, you've reached out to the membership. Um, every guild has a membership coordinator person that will help you get the list of the things you need to do to qualify to get in the union. And so over a couple of years, you're making sure that you're working on jobs where those hours are going to count to the union. And what are the differences of being able to, where can you work? You also sometimes, depending upon your skill set, people like Derica are, are members of multiple unions that expand the different types of jobs that they can have in these different places. So um, can you talk a, a little bit about your choice to be in the union and how it worked well for you. But I think costume design, there's a lot of opportunity, even if you don't live where there's a union or don't want to have a union lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, the main reason I'm in the union is, um, again, for the, the kind of like security and stability of uh, my rates and also healthcare, our insurance is great. Um, I also will speak, I, I mean, I have an agent that has nothing to do with the union. I think people get confused about what it, a union does not get you jobs. It does, a, an agent does not necessarily get you jobs. They're there to regulate your contracts once you get the jobs. And I think a lot of people get confused about what, what roles are what. And, and, you know, the union you have to pay dues to, um, you pay a percentage also with your agent. And I would say if you're able to get jobs without having an agent, well, first off, you can get, you're getting jobs without an agent. The agent is there mostly to negotiate terms and contracts. And also maybe, maybe they're, you know, sending you out on other things. But a lot of times, most of my jobs have come from my own, my own word of mouth or people just knowing me and the network that I've created. It's a really about creating community. And I think the easiest way to, especially people living in LA, we have so many film festivals here. Go to the film festivals, go to the panels, go to the screenings where they have the, 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 the crew, the cast, that's how you meet a lot of people. I, early on, I was really active of going to like Sundance and Black Star Film Festival in Philly and um, Hollywood Shorts. And just like, I was really active of being present in the community that I wanted to join. So that was, that's a huge thing. Um, was, and and unions don't to do necessarily it. do that. It's a great time to do it now because of COVID. Almost every festival has a virtual component, so you don't even have to, if you're not ready to go into theaters yet, you can still find those films at those festivals that really resonate, that you think are beautiful, and get on that IMDb and look at those designers. You'll start seeing the same designers' names that are kind of in their mid-career that may be a place that you could reach out and ask to, to intern or apprentice or PA. 
um, and find the people that are making the stuff that you know you could artistically contribute to. I love that. I love that. Yeah, that's, I mean, I just like being in the mix because I was like, well, it, to me, it wasn't so much about meeting other designers. It was about meeting filmmakers. Because, like, even for me, like, you as a producer, I'm like, it's not always about meeting director. The producers know the directors. So yeah. if you vibe and gel with the producer, producer can be like, you know, sure. what? I know someone who's yeah, looking absolutely. Just yeah, a lot of our audience is looking for that first step. Yeah. And so so it's really about the costume design. That bridge. It's really a great way to find the filmmakers that are making things that resonate and who are the costume designers that they're hiring. Because that's where a lot of our audience can maybe. It's great. It's such a great time because when we started, there was you couldn't just go on Facebook or Instagram and and just reach out to somebody and post something in their comment that you love their work and you'd love to learn from them. Um, I think the costume designers community and the wardrobe community is so warm and embracing and open. I have found people on LinkedIn that yeah. I've collaborated with and have become friends with both creatively and in my personal life. I, I, I just find people who work in this part of the business to be super warm and, and they love to help each other as well. And so it can be really intimidating coming in from the outside, but once you reach out, somebody's gonna respond. Somebody is going to be open to giving you advice or even an opportunity. Get ready, be ready. Yeah, so as we wrap up, yeah, it's that curiosity guy has that. Yeah. So as we wrap up, do you have advice about what are one or two things that people should be doing to get themselves ready for when they have a Ruth Carter say, well, just meet me on set on Monday. Let's see what you can do. What were the things that you feel people that have access to everything at their fingertips? Um, what can people be reading or learning about that would help them get ready? Do you think? So one of my, um, one of the designers who I admire and also just love her trajectory is um, Deborah Landis. She's amazing. She is, she's at the, she's the chair of the UCLA costume department there. And she does an annual Hollywood costume, um, like symposium and yeah. all kind of things. So she has a few different books she's written. One is called Dressed. Another one is Hollywood Costume. Um, she also is the costume designer for Coming to America, uh, which is one of my favorites. And I mean, iconic. And um, what is it? Raiders of the Lost Ark. What's the original one? You know what I'm talking about? Raiders of the Lost Ark. Indiana, it, no, Indiana Jones. I was like, what's the original called? Oh, yeah. Uh, Indiana. 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 But she uh, she has a lot of great resources to from how she has transitioned more to become like a scholar in, in costume, but how she also really supports costume designers. So she has again, I said like I think three or four books. I think she has the illustration one too. Also illustrators. I forgot about that as a profession. I don't really That's work on it. Yeah. But, you know, if you're in art and into like fashion sketching, you can become an illustrator as well. Um, and they're in my union in the design union 829, 892, sorry, uh, costume designers guild. Um, yeah, I mean that I I met her. I'm not sure exactly how I met her, but I remember meeting her and then I set up a meeting to talk to her because I actually wanted to go down that route of the more of the scholarly approach. And yeah, more academic. I want to matriculate into as I get like more into my life. Um, to go into that route, there's so many things I want to explore um, within costume that I want to do. I like being a practical designer, but there, I feel like the way I speak about costume, I feel like I can, I, I love watching films and, and looking obviously at the costumes. And that's what gets me. I love looking at my colleagues work. Like, mm -hmm. I love looking at it uh, and sometimes I'm like. I, I, I don't know if I want to execute it as much as I like to admire it because it's some, they're just such brilliant designers out there. Um, in, in, in the film and just like, again, this collaborative experience about being in this field is what I enjoy the most. Um, mm. 
So just in terms of All great advice, those are great. Yeah, those are really great resources. Um, I also um, I don't I I um, don't know if she's still with us, uh, but anybody else that has any books, um, but Jack Jacqueline Saint Anne, I don't know if you're still with us, but if you have any books or online resources that you would like for us, please feel free to share in the chat. Thank you so much for joining us, and and definitely her. She works at FITM, which is another oh, yes. great destination. Was, I work there too. Yeah, so I the, work um, as an exhibition. Yeah, uh, FITM is a really great, yeah, FITM is a really great first step, a first website to check out if you are interested. You think in this space, they have a lot of education. Also, please um, go to our link at the motionpicturecostumers.org. They do have a link of resources and lists. Um, all the Southern California uh, places that have um, training programs and education geared towards a, a career in this part of the business. So, um, thank you so much for sharing this time with us on a, a Saturday morning and oh, so excited yes. about your new show on Hulu. Um, I have a new show coming out next week, guys. It's called True Story. It's on Netflix. So it's with Kevin Hart and Wesley Snipes. So that's nice. my latest work. That's, that's coming good. out. Uh, so catch that next week. It um, comes out on Thanksgiving. So much great stuff happening for you and the people that you're hiring and being able to create, seeing you be able to create opportunity when you, it's just been so wonderful to see the group that you're pulling together and making amazing work with. Super cool. Thank you for having me. For you. Thank you so much. Um, so. And please imagine that you're in a room full of people that are clapping their heads off for you right now. So uh, we love you. We thank you for sharing so much of this really great and inspired information. And especially because on paper, it could seem like, well, everybody just magically gets in and it's this closed circle and it, and you got in, your dad's got to be somebody. And, and that didn't happen for any of us. We all initiated the email or the phone call that created the opportunity in our careers. So thank you for sharing your pathway because I hope it'll inspire somebody else that on Monday, they can make that same email happen for themselves. Yes. I love it. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank Caroline, you. for having us. Thank you so much thank for being know. here. It was such a good conversation. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, Derica. I feel like we just scratched the surface. There's so much and like- We could have gone for hours. You I know. It's such a rich, rich, because it's such a huge, world costume yeah. design is massive there are massive jobs and there's massive places that it impacts across industries yeah um and thank you so much for the folks in the chat too offering up a lot of resources so i'll click all the resources that um y'all have thank and then we'll put it together into a resource document about everything we talked about today and send it out to you all so you can have that for your record so you can explore more um if you'd like to explore more about the topic today, we will also email out the link to recording the presentation to, to everyone who registered, uh, so you can watch it again. It should come out in the next week or two weeks or so. Um, and our next Creative Career Paths event will be on Saturday, December 4th at 11 a.m. again, talking about getting to the world of special effects. Uh, so to learn more about the Creative Career Path series or see past event recordings, recordings and a resource list uh, visit us at lacountylibrary.org uh, slash creative dash career dash paths i'm clapping and pasting that into the chat right now um and if you have any ideas about other kinds of professions you want to see featured as a part of this series in the future future please share it with us um, and if you're interested in participating in more of our upcoming virtual programs please visit us at lacountylibrary.org. Have an amazing weekend, everybody.